Kia ora koutou. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a very important historic uh, first uh, broadcast regarding our Kaipra Kai project. And, uh, and I would just like to uh, welcome you all this evening uh, to this uh, broadcast. Uh, so we have uh, our, a very important uh, expert with us, uh, Tim Morris, who's going to be uh, presenting the important work that he's been leading inside the Kaipra project, which is part of the three Kaipra Kickstart projects for which Kaipra District Council has received Provincial Growth Fund funding. Now, I'd just like to quickly go back and re refresh everyone's memories on that. Those three interconnected projects are, number one, a uh, large amount of money for the roads in Kaipra District. Number two, some work regarding the wharf network for the Kaipra Harbour, which connects with Auckland. And number three, the Kai for Kaipra project. And how these three projects fit together basically is that what we do in Kaipra is we grow food. Literally, Kai, the Māori word for food, is in our name. And for a very, very long time, Kaipra has been known as a great and important food basket for New Zealand and for our own people here in Kaipara. The work that we're doing with the PGF projects is about integrating an improvement for our road network so that the food that we're producing can get to market faster. We're creating a wharf network so that we can potentially ship out food by sea direct to Auckland, which is just across the Kaipara Harbour. And, and thirdly, and very importantly, building on the food industry that we already have and that we do so well here. As I say, um, Kai and Kaipara is absolutely in our name. And here's the other important thing. Across the North Kaipara Agricultural Delta, which is the area from Ruawai North to uh, Hangawahini, that area has the largest single area of high grade soils north of Auckland, north of Pukekohe. And as New Zealand is looking to feed an increasingly hungry world, so we need to look to our great soils. So we'll be handing uh, over now to Tim Morris, who's going to tell us all in much more detail about the important work that he and his team have been leading from Coriolis Research and the Giblin Group have been leading here regarding the food industry, Kai, the Kai part of this project. Uh, and we'll also be hearing a bit about the Kaipra Kai hub as well, which is located in Ruawai, which is in that area, as I say, of the North Kaipara Agricultural Delta. So uh, I'm about to hand over to Tim Morris. So brief introduction on Tim. Uh, he has a uh, degree from Cornell University. So it's an Ivy League degree uh, from America. And uh, the important thing uh, here is that he uh, is an expert with significant international experience. We've been working now inside Kaipara District Council now for uh, months with Tim, uh, but so please uh, excuse his American accent. All right. So, but uh, notwithstanding that, it's, it's he's a very, very talented and uh, and wise uh, person who uh, has generously uh, led uh, our our important research here, and he's going to uh, be giving us a glimpse of that now. So, uh, handing over to Tim Morris uh, and. Uh, and I uh, look forward to seeing you all at the end of the uh, presentation. Kia ora, Tim. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Um, look, thank you so much, everyone who, who's watching. Uh, with that introduction, I suppose I should introduce myself. Look, I, I was, I was actually, I, I have an American accent, and as the as uh, the mayor said, you're going to need to excuse that. I was actually born in Lincoln, uh, Lincoln University. My father was teaching animal husbandry uh, there, uh, and I was born at the Lincoln University Hospital, uh, where my mother was a nurse. So much as I sound like an American, uh, I, I'm from a long line of New Zealanders. One side of my family is all farmers, way back to the ships, and the other side of my family is all grocers, uh, way back to the ships. So 
uh, I, I do think I have uh, food in my blood. Uh, I've started my career out at the other end of the food chain, working in supermarkets uh, in the US, um, in, in California and Seattle. I worked for Kraft, uh, worked for Nestle, worked for a number of other companies, uh, and then uh, now work in consulting. So I'm not gonna go through the whole document. Uh, it, it's, it's 200 and something pages. This is rather sort of a taster for it. This is an introduction to it that hopefully uh, encourages you to um, uh, encourages you to get interested in it and engage with the material. Uh, so, so let's let's have a look at it. The way I've structured this is to make it conversational. So I've structured it as as a set of questions, uh, which I'll then proceed to answer. So, the five questions uh, I'm going to go through here. So the first question is, you know, look, what what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, the second question is, look, is is there an opportunity to diversify food production in the region? Uh, third. Uh, what did we do? What was the process? How did how did you come to the answers that you came to, or or, or not? Um, and, and then what is our answer or answers? Uh, and then finally, where do we go from here? What are the next steps? And and go into some questions. So I'm going to talk for about uh, 40, uh, 30, 35, 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, uh, the questions are going to come through in the in the comments to me. So let's get into the problem we're trying to solve. Kuiper currently accounts for 1.2 percent of New Zealand's area. Um, so more than 1% of, of New Zealand, half a percent of the population, and an estimated 1.1% of food production. The population of, of, of Kaipara has grown strongly in the last decade. It's grown strongly over the long term, but certainly grown strongly in the last uh, decade. That, that growth is projected to slow going forward. I think these, these uh, uh, projections are probably light. They're out of statistics New Zealand. I think it's a great region going to continue to grow. The wider food industry. Uh, accounts for almost half of all employment in Kaipara. And look, you know, I, I've worked my whole life in the food industry and, and every dog has his day. And um, anytime the economy goes down, uh, you know, you can, you, can, uh, you can put off getting a new carpet, uh, but you can't put off dinner. Um, there's a lot of things that are discretionary. Food isn't one of them. And we've seen that exactly right, you know, in the last few months through COVID. Um, there weren't very many sectors that were essential. Um, you know, if they run out of car parts at the BMW dealership, so what? Uh, if they run out of toilet paper, this mass panic. So all of you, you know, watching and, and, and listening in the food industry, we're in the right industry. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later. But when you look at it, not just agriculture, but agriculture services into agriculture, uh, food and beverage manufacturing, wholesaling, food retailing and food service, almost half of all jobs in Kuiper come from that. The challenge for the region uh, is that over the past two decades, Kuiper has not created any new employment in this chain. So we have the chain; it's there, but we've got a growing population. But we don't; we're not creating uh, we're not creating new jobs in food, and we can. Kuiper is underperforming. So when we just do a little, because of a quick, you know, how are we going versus the you know the, the other players in the league, the other teams in the league, if you wanted to say that, um, Kuiper is underperforming against all of its neighbors in creating agricultural output from the land. So Kuiper's uh, producing about $112,000 per square kilometer of agricultural, you know, agricultural output. Uh, we go out to places like Fongaray, Western Bay of Plenty, um, Mata, Mata, Mata Piaco, you know, much larger numbers. We, we can do better. So if we could do that, if we could match the performance of our neighbors, we could easily add 20 to 230 million directly to regional GDP. And so it's not, it's a simplification, and, but if we could, that was just per person, if the population didn't go up and the agriculture went up, so just through better crops, different crops, uh, that would be almost $10,000 a person. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to find how do we, how do we kickstart uh, some, some growth uh, in, into agriculture? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to solve. Is there an opportunity? Look, yeah, I'll answer the question right here, yes. Uh, Kuiper has a unique position in New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand food landscape. We've got a well-watered subtropical climate. I, I know we have periods of drought. We do a lot of work in, in Australia. Uh, New Zealanders often complain about drought. Um, that's nothing. Uh, you know, Kuiper is a paradise relative to just about anywhere in Australia. Um, God bless Australia, but, um, you know, it's pretty dry other than Tasmania. Uh, cl close to Auckland and Whangarei, uh, un uh, un un there's also untapped capacity for growth. Uh, we're not certainly not tapping out the region in the way that you would look at somewhere, um, you know, like Singapore. There's, there's just no more land left. You know, uh, f flexible skills and capabilities. We've got the capabilities of farming in the region, and we do have a reputation and identity. You know, we're a trusted food producer, uh, currently primarily known as the Coomer Capital of, of New Zealand. But 
you've got to start from somewhere and that's a good base. People, people know the region and they trust it. As I said, uh, Kuiper has got a, a subtropical climate that provides attractive, uh, very attractive growing conditions uh, relative to the rest of New Zealand, uh, relative to a, a, a lot of the rest of the world, um, I have to say. Kuiper has the resources uh, required to produce more food. Um, I, I don't want to labor this, want to drag it out, but let's just be realistic. There's lots of fertile land, as, as the mayor talked about. There's a mixture of soils. We've got a mild climate, water, people. Uh, we've got three large scale sectors at scale, which I'll talk about close to Auckland. We've got the brand New Zealand halo effect uh, and relatively lo low cost farmland. The industry is also, Kuiper is also very well supported by a wide range of complementary activities supporting growth. And again, I don't want to go through all of these. I think everyone listening will be fully aware that New Zealand's very good at food. Um, we've got a modern, well-functioning economy. We've got some great universities, uh, industry bodies, R&D, uh, plant and food, et cetera. Great, so Kuiper has three distinct types of uh, food producers. So if we say, who, who have we got in, in the region? We've got lifestyle or hobby farmers at, 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 um, at farmer's market scale. We've got a number of categories that would be in that, things like uh, olives, olive oil, local fruits and veggies, sauces and chutneys, things like that. Um, we've got biosecure, we've got basically one large biosecure secondary crop at domestic scale. So Kumra, that's produced for the domestic market. It's biosecure, imports can't come in. Um, and uh, we, we've had some goes at exports that haven't made it work yet, which is an, another opportunity and, and not gonna belabor that one today, but there, there are opportunities for more to do more in, in Kumra. Um, and then we've got globally competitive sectors at scale where, where you know, we have large processors in the region. Uh, so uh, we've got silver fern farms uh, doing beef and sheep, and we've got Fonterra doing dairy. So in those categories, we're, we're globally competitive. Uh, we, we send our product to the world. However, the vast majority of the existing value, I mean, much as sort of we're known as the, the Coomer capital, uh, the vast majority of existing value created in agriculture in Kuiper comes from globally competitive sectors um, at, at scale. So probably, you know, 80 plus percent of, of the value in the region we'd estimate would be would be basically the the, the, the wider cattle chain, beef and beef and and dairy and and sheep. Uh, Kumra would be would be the secondary one, and then a wide wide range of other things. Some of which are, are we discussed in the document. Things like avocados, which are definitely tending in the direction of getting big. So over focused on a handful of areas. Yes, there is an opportunity to diversify. Mo moving on to the third question then. So what did we do? What, what was the process? How did we think that we might get to an answer? Let's let's have a look at that. The project, uh, before I even get into them, and, and again, as the, as the mayor sort of alluded to, it's a small part of a wider set of work uh, designed to enable a step change uh, in the Kuiper district. Um, so there's work on roads, work on wharves, and then growing Kai. And then within Kai, there's work on water, which um, Williamson are doing. There's this project, uh, and then there's the Topo Climate Study done by, by Niwa Plant and Food. And land care. Um, in particular, what we're doing here builds on the, this topo climate study, um, and, and that's got some st stunning information in it that the region should be really happy to have about the different soils and the climates and, and uh, potential for production. We received uh, clear guidance on the focus of the project and the types of products we wanted to be assessed. We, the project's very much focused on um, things that we can do now. Let's get moving on this quick outcomes, results, not reports, you know, moving forward. And, and particularly in, in, in Coomera, the things that we can rotate into Coomera, we're not, we're not after just a report, theoreticals, and things that can't be actioned by farmers uh, in, the, in the region. And we are also looking at and recognizing the character of, of the region where we're looking for products that both can target smaller producers and assist them who, who sort of predominantly uh, in, in the East um, and then um, larger scale volume things that might be able to be done in the, in, in the West. And so really trying to find a portfolio of, of answers. There are some limitations and, and we need to acknowledge those. Um, existing property boundaries can't be easily redrawn uh, or transition to radically different field structures. We, we do quite a bit of global benchmarking work. And so if you, on the left here, we've got the Kuiper region, uh, familiar to all of you. Uh, and then on the right, there's a shot out of Eastern Washington State, uh, which used to be sort of all mid high plains desert. And then they just, um, you know, put piv huge pivots up and, and irrigate it. This is similar to what we're seeing in parts of the McKenzie. So there are limitations to what we can do in the region. Uh, another limitation on, on what we can do with the, are the laws and, and what, what 
people in government call social license, which is a is a sort of fancy word for just saying you can't do that. Um, tobacco is one. Um, tobacco is a huge product globally, which you can't have a license for in, in New Zealand. Opium is another one. They've gone into that in a big way in, in Australia. Um, and, you know, when you talk about the opiate crisis in the U.S., opium is the, the other end of it. The Australians are doing billions, a billion dollars, and you know, billions of dollars in it. Uh, trout aquaculture, uh, again, you, you, it's banned in New Zealand, and, and large-scale feedlot dairies. So we're going to recognize that you know, not everything is possible in the region. We need to acknowledge that. Um, but if we start to think about what is limited, there's a range of things that, that don't necessarily um, might, might work in the region, but probably aren't going to make sense. I'm not going to belabor these. And, and I do love the Irish uh, strawberry tree, and, and I do think that's an opportunity. Um, so where did we get the ideas from? I don't want to belabor the limitations. So where, where did the ideas come from? Plant and food contributed some, uh, some ideas to us. Um, we looked at New Zealand's import data, because all other things being equal, New Zealand mostly produces what it needs, but we do produce some things. Um, then we talked to regional stakeholders, and we also looked briefly at South Carolina. Why did we look at South Carolina? It's the largest uh, Kumra sweet potato producing region in the US to see what they rotated in with Kumra. Um, so plant and food um, in part of their part of their ongoing piece of work, their piece of work that was sort of running in parallel with ours. Uh, they highlighted that the region had a climate and, and soils in, in parts that were suited to avocados, hemp, uh, hops, peanuts, and olives. We also also looked at import data. So this is uh, the value of the top um, 98 things that New Zealand imports. Apologies for the small font. Anyone who wants to read the detail of that, if you can't read that, um, it's, it's in the full report, which is on the, uh, the, the council website. But when you get into that, and I'll read sort of the top five or 10 here, um, palm, palm PKE, wheat, frozen pork, animal feed, uh, pet food, soy oil cake, which is used for animal feed, brewing dregs, which is used for animal feed, Raw sugar cane, uh, bananas, coffee, milled rice starts to get smaller after there. A lot of what we import in, in New Zealand is feed to go into our animal systems. And, and there's probably a message in that. We looked at North Carolina, as, as I mentioned before. Why did we look at North Carolina? Um, it's, it's got a similar subtropical climate. It's got a similar topology of sort of plains and hill country. And it's the number one uh, Kumba producing state in the US. And it's not dissimilar. Anyone who's been to the, the tidelands there would, would recognize it's not dissimilar to, to uh, parts of the Kuiper. In North Carolina, when you look at it, and then again, we've got quite a bit of material in the full document on this, but suggests a relatively narrow range of agricultural products for the Kuiper district. If we look at what they produce, it's meat, chickens, it's eggs, and it's pork. And then partly to produce the feed for that, their crop systems are animal feeds, as I've sort of already alluded to, soybeans, sort of the, the maize, corn, sweet corn chain, uh, sweet potato, obviously, peanuts, potatoes, cucumbers, blueberries, watermelons. It starts to get pretty small. Uh, beyond there. Cotton is another thing they produce. Tobacco is another one. And, and China, much as we've all stopped smoking or trying to, China still wants a lot of tobacco. Christmas trees was another one for smaller producers to think about um, a, a, as a crop um, uh, bigger than you would think. Um, so in stage one, we also received uh, input from a wide range of regional stakeholders. Uh, look, th thanks to all of them. I'm not going to read all of their names. They knew who they are. Um, all the good stuff in the, in the document was their idea and everything uh, idiotic was my fault. Um, so thank you to all of them. So that's what we did. We, we looked at a number of different ways to get information and, and, and fold that into the process. Uh, so then what's our answer? You did all of that. Wonderful. Tell us what the answer is. Let's have a look at that. Um, the products that, 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 that Kuiper can produce probably fall into, into four broad groups. Now, this isn't the ranking or any scoring of them yet, but you know, there's a number of things we can produce at this local scale, as I talked about. There are things that um, work in terms of domestic uh, domestic supply. Uh, there's things that are currently imported that we could potentially produce in the region. Uh, and then things that we're actually gonna go out and target export markets. And they are different segments and you have to be more competitive depending on where in that, that system you wanna get to. If you just wanna support local markets, you don't have to be very competitive. Domestic supply, you have to be more competitive. If you wanna take on imports, you've gotta be at the world price, the quality adjusted world price plus flight. And then if you, want to, if you want to take on export markets, you've got to be a low-cost producer, as we know from cattle, uh, dairy uh, systems, sheep. So the following crops came through out of that process. So those are crops, animals, agriculture systems emerged from stage one. Uh, so we've got a range of, of plant systems there, uh, artichokes, globe artichokes, Jerusalem artichokes, uh, avocados, bananas, beetroot, blueberries, capsicums, carrots, cucumbers, industrial hemp, hops, uh, olives, peanuts, pineapples, potatoes, rice, sorghum, soybeans, sweet corn, tomatoes. So then in land-based animal systems, 
Um, meat chickens, egg chickens, ducks, uh, Asians, particularly Chinese, eat a lot of ducks, and we've got a growing Asian population in New Zealand. Uh, goat dairy, goat sheep was, was the runner up to that. Pigs, and then in terms of aquaculture systems, mussels and, mussels and oysters. Each product was then developed. So if you go to the main document, there's, there's two pages for each of those products. Uh, one saying, what is it? What is, what is this product? What, remind me what it is again. Uh, and then the second part we look at, does it seem to suit Kuiper? It could be a great product and doesn't, doesn't suit the region so well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we looked at all of them for that. And again, I, I, would, I would urge you to go, and go to that material as a reference and have a look at it. So all 27 products were profiled uh, in stage two in this way. And, and as I said, all in the main document. We then brought together, so we looked at sort of the, in, at the size of the prize, how big could we, could we think we could get this thing as a sort of you know, straw man in sort of five to 10 years. And then on the other, other one, we looked at how well did it fit what we thought Hyper needed. Uh, and we sort of came out with a ranking there. And so you can sort of see, um, so as an example, pineapples, we, we thought it, you'd struggle to get more than $2 million and it and only had a, a sort of a good fit for the region. Whereas things like um, avocados, chicken meat, goat, dairy, and peanuts, uh, had a good score for the region and had a reasonable size of the prize uh, available available to us in this stage so um we then and I, I won't go through all of the scoring but so it was a part of how we came to those numbers and did a scoring on all of the products um then our size of the prizes varied there are sort of this prizes here for people of all sizes a globe artichoke might get to a, might get to a hundred thousand if it was lucky uh, whereas, whereas meat chicken could get out to a pretty big size, 30 to $50 million uh, easily. As a result, we then, so we sort of, then from the scoring in stage two, as I said, we, we then went into, into, into stage three with a handful of products. Uh, with it were peanuts, avocados, hops, dairy goats, and chicken meat all came through in the process. And then the advisory group also flagged sorghum because it's, a, it's an arable crop, it can be fed to animals, uh, and it's very, very drought tolerant. And so, and again, I want to make the point here, and I sort of we do work like this quite regularly. I need to make the point here that just because we say these are the or our processes said these are the best ideas doesn't mean that 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 any other idea that anyone else has is, is an idiotic idea. What it means is we went through a process, we looked at it a certain way, and, and this is the answer we came to. I'm going to give my details at the end of the report. If you want to tell me why I'm wrong, or you want to talk about a product that we didn't look at, please do give me a call and, and we're always happy to talk about our work and, and what we've seen. But um, for the purposes of this project, these were the six we identified. So each of them, each of the products was built out, as I said, in stage three, uh, in this 10 page process where we sort of, what is it? What's happening? What's driving success? What can you do with it? Why would it work? Who can we partner with? How's the supply chain organized, the market, et cetera. And so all of those are developed out in the in the document. I'm going to go through one of them, and the one that I'm going to go through is peanuts. So let, let's look at let's have a quick look at peanuts. I know there is interest in it, and it is a, a very clear rotation crop um, for um, uh, for Kumra. It, it also fixes uh, atmospheric nitrogen, so it's a, it's good for the soils. Uh, it can handle wet soils and clay soils and a whole range of you know sandy soils. It can handle a lot of things. Peanuts, African crop originally. Um, well, why peanuts? Uh, and I'm not going to read through uh, all all of these quotes. But it, look, it's on, it's on target, it's on message. People are looking for high protein, healthy diets. They're looking for uh, plant-based ingredients, plant-based foods. So it is, it's high in protein, it's seen as healthy. It's also a snack, that sort of ticks a, ticks a number of boxes in that um, peanut butter on its own globally is worth 3.3 billion US. So what's that current exchange rate? It's probably 6 billion, uh, 6 billion New Zealand you know, alone. Um, it's low calorie, healthy foods. What's Driving the success, so as I sort of talked about there, uh, sustainability, uh, veganism, vegetarianism, plant-based diets, uh, health, its health attributes, it's high in protein, it's gluten-free, perceived as a natural and healthy snack. Indulgence, it, it has a rich uh, salty flavor. And it's, look, it's got widespread use in Asian cuisines. I mean, if you, you go to most, uh, you know, any of the Asian cuisines, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, uh, Japanese, they've got peanut-based products in there. Um, uh, and then convenient. It, it, it's a it's a it's an easy to eat snack. Um, it, it's good, it's got a great flavor. So what can you do with it? I, I think if you if you think about it for a little while, you'll realize there's a lot of products um, uh, that you buy that have peanuts in them. You can at a very simple level, you can just roast them. Um, you can sort of whole whole roasted. Uh, you can put them in snack nuts, snack products. They're obviously in muesli bars. Uh, you can put it in peanut butter. Um, ready meal ingredients is a uh, peanut satay. Uh, they obviously make peanut oils. You can make an oil from it uh, to extract the fat. 
Um, you can make a peanut flour, and then obviously confectionery. So there's a wide number of uses. You're not tied to just one market. You're not tied to one one product. Um, you, you, you've got a wide range of products uh, that you can that you can make from it. So why would we do why, why would we do peanuts in the Kuiper? Why, why does it make any sense? Uh, so obviously, as I talked about, one it, it, it suits uh, it suits Kuiper's climate. Two, it's got the markets wanted. It's got growing demand in desirable markets. It's 25% uh, uh, protein, as I talked about, increasing global demand. Um, and then why do we think we can sell it? Uh, it's got a clear fit with, with brand Kuipera. If peanuts grow on the ground, Coomba grow on the ground, um, you know, similar looking landscape to some major producing regions, uh, safe and secure producer. Uh, we've got great proximity and access to Asian markets, and we've got an isolated location. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a good position uh, uh, for, for the region. One of the things that we like about peanut and, and peanuts and some of the other product things we're looking at is there's also some very obvious customers for it. I mean, one of the it's you know it's you, you can grow just about anything if you put your heart to it. But the hard part's finding finding customers. And and with this, we've got a lot of new. And all of these companies are, are not necessarily New Zealand owned, but they're, they're New Zealand based and they produce they produce in New Zealand. So Hicks is one. They've already expressed interest in in getting peanuts. Uh, Mother Earth uh, is another one. They make snack bars, uh, snack nuts, peanut butter, confectionery, etc. Uh, Heinz, Heinz Waddies uh, do, do a peanut butter. Whitaker's, obviously, it's an iconic uh, New Zealand chocolate bar with peanuts in it, uh, with, you know, growing exports to world markets. Uh, Griffin's, in the weird way that uh, the ETA brand has been split um, between Griffin's and Heinz for historical reasons. Uh, they've got nice and natural, so they do, they, they do snack nuts, they do muesli bars and biscuits. Sanitarium, obviously, they do breakfast cereals, peanut butters, and sort of soy and nut milks. Um, We've got Nut Brothers and Fix and Fogs from smaller peanut companies. So there's a wide range of customers, you know, and looking at that page, at least five of them would be very interested in, 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 in a New Zealand peanut. So that gives you that comfort again, as I said, the comfort to believe that, you know, that there's a market there. More work needs to be done on that and, and, and um, you know, really understand the, the, the requirements of these customers. But it's got a relatively straightforward uh, uh, value chain. Growers, uh, some some parts of it, they can then go on on farm or in local uh, markets for animal feed. And then it's then got to go into a primary stage, which often you know aggregates, cleans, and grades them. Uh, they also undertake shelling and roasting. We've then got it goes into further processing for things like peanut butter and into snack manufacturers, and then it can go to a range of markets. So what's the market situation? Br broadly speaking, there's no domestic production at any kind of scale that we can tell. Uh, and so if we look at imports of un, you know, uh, unroasted shelled, roasted shelled, mixed nuts and peanut butter, it's about a $42.8, $43 million market, uh, 14,000 tons. So there's a, there's, a, there's a market there there to be had if we, can, if we can meet the market, as they say. So what's the size of the opportunity? And this is sort of a, a conceptual straw man, but, but again, just so just for peanuts, um, if we planted four and a half thousand hectares of it, and we got the a, a yield similar to the U.S., so four and a half tons a hectare, uh, we'd be looking at twenty thousand tons. You get thirty-five percent shelled yield. We'd get about seven thousand tons of peanuts. If we could get the landed price for for raw shelled, we'd have a twenty million dollar value industry in the Kuiper. If farmers got sixty-six percent of that, they'd be getting uh, thirteen million or three thousand a hectare for a mechanically harvested crop. Um, now, again, this needs more work and it's just a straw man, but it says there is an opportunity there. And then if, if farmers own the, um, the, the processing, you know, um, the, the processing part of that, they would get some of the, the, the other value there out to the 20 million. How could we do it? So, so what's our vision for peanuts? Uh, Kuiper could build a vibrant peanut sector leading to a net scale further processing industry, supplying New Zealand and export markets. Uh, we need to, so one, we need to promote uh, the benefits of peanut growing to farmers in the region. And look at the varieties and yields, and this is one of the things that Matt's working on. Um, two, we, we could build the market initially with New Zealand producers, uh, and then um, investigate three investigate potential partners for joint venture processing. So, the architecture I've gone through there is for peanuts. We've done that for all six of the things that we identified as having very high potential in um, in, in in stage uh, in stage three. So let's see, where do we go from here? What do we need to do to make this happen? It's pretty easy to put together, a, relatively speaking, a consulting report. It's pretty easy to, to, to have some good ideas. How do we make something happen in the region? How do we change so that in the future, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, we're not the Coomer capital, we're the Coomer and peanut capital, or, or even the wider food bowl of, of you know, north of Auckland. Um, what are the next steps? 
uh, we, we propose three key questions for those wanting to take any of these opportunities forward and, and, and or your own opportunities. Um, so the first question is, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? What do we need to what do we need to do to get to get to good? What do we need to get to good? You know, the, the, the word world class is bandied around, and 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 I often find that world class means that I've heard of. But but um, what do we need need to do to get to world class? How, do, how are we gonna, can we take on the major peanut producers in in the U.S. and elsewhere? You know, how do we get to those kind of yields? How do we get four and a half tons a hectare with it? Question number one. Two. What do our high potential customers want? Knowing what the customer wants, what do our high potential customers want? And so for that, think about people like PIX, think about think people like Mother Earth, um, Whitakers. What do they want? And let's produce the product that they want. Um, and then third, who, who, who or how are we going to pay for what's needed post farm gate? Uh, is that going to be a farmer owned co op? Is it going to be a different structure? We're going to attract investors um, uh, uh, for it um post farm gate and then i think pulling all of that together is who wants to work together on this i don't think there are any opportunities here of any of the opportunities that we've looked at um that anyone can do on their own no 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 man or woman is an island and and, and there's going to need to be a coalition of people come together to make any of these happen just as there has been historically in kumra just as there has been historically in in in, in our and our grandparents great grandparents time in, in in the meat industry uh, silver fern farms is is, is a farmer owned co-op Ontario with with the Milkland farmer owned co-op, you know, Delta farmer owned co-op, you know, there are solutions to these things and it's it, they come from working together. Who, who, who should I call? Who should I talk to? And I suppose here's before we go to the questions, my my my, my opportunity to sort of uh spruik spruik Matt a little, but um if you've got any project relation question related questions, uh why didn't you look at insert random uh crop here? Please give me a call. We're always happy to talk about our work. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about it. Pick up the phone and give me a call. I'm happy to talk about it. If you've got on the ground questions, uh, you, you're incredibly lucky to have Matt in the region. Um, give Matt a call. I'm going to wind. I'm going to. I'm going to wind. Um, I'm, I'm going to wind up there. I'll wind up and start taking um, at least some of the questions uh, that that I that I have here. In your experience, what is your opinion on the changing food market in New Zealand post COVID? Uh, do you think there are more opportunities for domestic food products than ever before? Uh, has it changed much since you wrote this study? Um, yeah, we're doing some work on on COVID right now uh, for a number a number of clients. But COVID, New Zealand's come out of COVID looking great. Um, you look at the disaster that's the U.S. You look at the disaster that's the U.K. Um, normally, countries we often look to. Uh, you know, we've done the right thing. We we, we we've shut it down. Uh, the ships kept leaving New Zealand. Uh, we were a reliable supplier. We didn't. We, we might have closed the border to tourists, but we didn't close it to product going out. Um, I think brand New Zealand. If you think about what is, if you talk to people, what is brand New Zealand? Clean and green, safe, trusted, um, secure food supply, rule of law. I think it only amplifies brand New Zealand. We, 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 we you know, by far the best performing Western Western country out of it. So I think it's making more opportunities for New Zealand and export markets. I think it's going to encourage investment into New Zealand long run. Uh, it's also highlighted the food industry as um, there have been various points, uh, you know, in the past that people have described the food industry to me as a sunset industry, and we were all going to, um, you know, be bearded hipsters in brick-lined rooms, um, you know, uh, uh, writing writing web apps or something like that, you know. And and in practice, no, 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 you know, we're good at food in New Zealand. It's a great industry. We've realized it's essential. And more than that, we recognize that you know we need it to live. So I don't think our opinion on any of this changes. Uh, in the long run, you know, the whole COVID thing is is a blip for us, uh, and if anything, it strengthens brand uh, brand New Zealand. Um, okay, so next one. Uh, looking at this research, how do I choose which crop I should be going for? Um, good question. At the end of the day, I mean, you know, we're management consultants. We work on the food industry. I, I, we've got an opinion. Some of that's expressed in the document here. Um, you know the the, the 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 mayor and the government and the and the, and the provincial growth fund. I mean, at the end of this, from the government, we're here to help. You, when things change, when 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 change occurs, it's driven by passionate individuals. Um, so the, I guess suppose the answer to that is, how do I choose which crop I should go for? Which one which one excites you? Which one makes you passionate? Which one do you want to go and 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 make happen? Because it's a long, hard slog to make any business a success, and, and certainly getting into a new crop is that. So, what can you get passionate about? Um, and, and I think there's opportunities for people of all sizes. Next one: um, 
uh, from Amari uh, Fano Trust, uh, fertile land that's currently unused. Um, so next to the Moana, so there are opportunities for oyster spats and mussel farms, mullet power and eel farming also opportunities. Are these options that we should be exploring? Um, I like aquaculture and, and the questions you're asking are about aquaculture. Um, but Graham Stewart, who, who used to be the head of strategy at Fonterra and then um, was running Sea Lord, <laughs> we interviewed him on it. On we've done quite a bit of work on aquaculture. Um, uh, he, he said, you know, you want to be, this, everyone says it, but you know, you want to be the third owner of an aquaculture venture because the first two owners go under. And aquaculture is hard. Um, whoever wrote this question, um, give me a call and, and, and I'll, I'll send you through some of this, the, the other government work we've done on aquaculture and talk to you about it. Um, yeah, aquaculture is hard. Uh, seaweed, seaweed, sea, you know, smaller scale. It depends on your scale. It depends on what scale you're looking at. But give me a call. I'll, I'll give you some free consulting. Um, next one. What, what, would, what would be the next steps for a landowner who's interested in exploring these options? Um, I'm going I'm to plug Matt here. Matt, talk to Matt, talk to Matt, and talk to Matt. Um, and then, if, if, if you know, um, have a look at the, the, the huge wealth of research that's there in the, in the, in the Topo Climate Study. You know, try to understand your land, try to understand your soils, try, try to understand if the idea that, that seems to, you know, motivate you, uh, it, it suits, suits where you are. Um, then the questions in terms of what's, um, what's come through. Um, good from uh, Beth Stone. At one point in this report, you mentioned Kuiper as a food destination. This seems an excellent idea. Do you advocate for this? If not, why not? Um, food is one of those things that, that, that brings life to the land. It's incredible like that. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work in Australia and you know, you go out in the outback and, and there's just nothing. There's just nothing. And then they've got giant mines um, where they, the workers fly in and they fly out and the towns are you know, what, the wild west. And, and they don't have that life in the way that, that, that food does create life. And if you think about, you know, the great, the, the great places of this earth, if you want to go to, you know, want to go to Tuscany or somewhere like that, or Ireland, it, it's food that makes it interesting, you know, parts of rural France. And, and so um, I would, um, I, I think it's possible. I, 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 think, um, I think, I think it's going to be easier in the East uh, uh, than the West. Um, uh, to create a true food food destination, I think I think all of the region can do it, but I think um, your classic tourist destination has to be things like it's typically things like wine, it's smaller producers, um, and so it, definitely opportunities and 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 it probably varies by region. I hope I haven't um, stuck my foot in there with that one. Um, next one, um, question from Facebook user uh, Steve. Uh, Medical cannabis. We looked at hemp uh, and we didn't look at medical cannabis. Um, it was sort of out of scope. We were primarily focused on food rather than, than pharmaceuticals, be they, be they recreational. Uh, cannabis is going to be a very interesting industry. It's going to be a big industry for, for New Zealand. Um, a lot of that, the, the medical stuff is going to be grown in, 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 in greenhouses, controlled, controlled atmosphere. No, sorry, no, controlled environment, not controlled atmosphere, controlled, controlled environment. Um, it would clearly suit Kuiper and, and again, without sticking my foot in it, um, it, it look all through the Northland, let's be realistic. There's a lot of people that have capabilities uh, in it. So I, I think when, if, and when that is legalized, it's going to be a big opportunity. Um, I would, I would probably argue that, that the, the, the medical bit, I think, I, I think we can get our head around the bit that's probably more interesting is the CBD containing can, um, can, cannabis, the high CBD ones. Um, to, 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 because that goes, that's going into a lot of food now in, in, in markets where it's legalized. You're seeing it in, you know, biscuits and crackers and all, and all things like that. I think there's gonna be a big rush into the medical piece of it. The high CBD stuff is probably a, a clear niche and that can be grown outside as well. So I'd probably highlight that as well, but yes, I, it, so we didn't look at it, but it's definitely an opportunity. It was out of scope, uh, from Facebook user, Georgina, um, pepper also has high lime content in the soil. What grows best in this in this soil? Um, different different parts of, of of Kuiper have different soils, and I, I think that came out very very clearly. Look, some some parts are heavy clay, some parts are are very sandy down on the on the peninsula. Uh, there's a mix of opportunities. Um, I would I, I'm 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 going to I'm going to kick that one to, probably to Matt to Matt to Matt as well. 
Um, I don't, it, it's not as simple as high, high or low limes. It's the whole characteristics uh, of, your, of your environment and, and your soils. If we go back to what I was saying before, and I'd like, I'd like to go back to a, um, uh, to a page in this, it's just I think about, and I think about that question and some of the other questions. Um, as I think about what I've said, um, the temptation in anything like this is to think about the bigger products, the, the things that, that, you know, can we get to 50 million? Can we get to 100 million? And, you know, can, can, we, can we make a big, a big industry out of this? And as you start to go looking for those products, um, your list gets shorter and shorter, you're getting into shorter and shorter and shorter lists of products. But when you're at the smaller, uh, the smaller end of town, when you're at the local level, the hobby level, the lifestyle level, um, there's a much wider range of range of opportunities. In fact, I, I'd almost argue that that um, the more different things, uh, the better. Um, a tropical apricot, and wow, it is sour. But you could build a business out of that. It wouldn't be a big business, but you could build a business out of it. Um, actually, go to the subtropica, but you, you can build a business out of that. You can sell that to high end restaurants or, or, or bars. I, I think there are more opportunities and more options. Uh, for smaller producers than there are for people who want to be larger producers. If you're if you're a large scale landowner and you want to move a significant amount of land uh, into into you know say out of um, uh, dairy or or um, other products like that into uh, plant based products, you're looking at a pretty narrow range of products. If you're a smaller producer, uh, there's the, the world's your oyster, and and uh, probably more than that. Think about um, creating and adding adding value. Uh, in the region, um, we did a report on um, alcoholic spirits uh, quite a few years, oh, about eight, seven, eight years ago now. Um, and and at the time, we were highlighting there were huge opportunities in alcoholic spirits. And since then, there's been an absolute explosion uh, in in, uh, in in growth of that product. Uh, think about growing. If you want to think about diversification, think about producing something you can turn into uh, into into an alcoholic spirit and sell it sell it the duty free. Well, that that <laughs> that segment's pretty quiet right now. Um, other uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I was just going to say, um, uh, because we've still got a uh, quarter of an hour to go here, um, it would be an interesting opportunity as well at this point to bring in uh, Matt Hunter, hmm. uh, and to introduce Matt, and to try and um, get uh, everyone who's watching, who's here in Kaipara, to be familiar with Matt and what he's doing with the Kai Hub and how if you like this wonderful research that that you've skipped us through very um, quickly for such amazing research, uh, Tim, um, um, how how it's kind of touching the going to touch the ground. Um, uh, so uh, so that that's what I'd propose right now. Is that is that good? We go with that. Yes. Yeah, that sounds great. If, if Matt's here, okay. great. Okay, thank you, Matt. So um, so. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen are watching, yeah, so we have Matt Punter, who is the manager of the Kaipara Kai Hub, which is the physical facility uh, that's located in Ruawai, which is the central part of Kaipara District. It's equidistant between um, the West Coast and the East Coast, uh, so it's kind of easy for everyone to get to or as hard for anyone to get to as it is for anyone else. <laughs> Uh, if you like, but um, uh, Matt comes uh, with significant experience in uh, horticulture, on plant and food background, and uh, and uh, is joined us as the manager of the Kaipara Kai Hub, uh, which is also run through Northland Inc., uh, which is the economic development agency for all of Northland. So I'd like to hand over to Matt. Now, um, and for you to explain to uh, our viewers um, something about your role, and as Tim's already said, you know, if you like, how accessible you are, uh, and how uh, we can move forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing other questions are coming in as well, so we will return to them as well. Thank you. Over to you, Matt. Thank Hello. you, Mr. Meter. Um, Good day, everyone. Um, just uh, as a first thing. Um, I'll just answer Liz's uh, question about uh, uh, dragon fruit. Um, there is some research going on in that space at the moment within New Zealand, um, looking at how we get the uh, dragon fruit into the country um, and, and how we 
because at the moment it's, uh, there, there's not the there's not the commercial species here. So there is some research going on in that space. Um, so yeah, keep uh, if you want any more information about that, um, yeah, give us a call or, or come down to the hub and and we can have a chat about that. Um, Australian yeah. dragon fruit production has um, is growing and, and they're getting exports into Asia. Um, it's mm. a counter, counter, counter seasonal, I believe, partly. So that, it is an opportunity, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, just uh, on the uh, on the Kuiper Kai Hub. Um, yeah, as we said, um, we're we're there to um, obviously to to support and to facilitate uh, all the discussions in and around uh, food production. In the in the in the Kuiper region, um, uh, we we offer a raft of uh, or, or we obviously have quite uh, some very strong research behind us. Um, Tim's just gone through the feasibility study. Um, there's the topography and land studies, and uh, there's also uh, quite a strong action plan that's been uh, the, that's been presented as well, which which gives us some some guidance and some opportunities. Um, in terms of the hub itself, yes, we, we've got the hub as a physical presence in Ruawai, but probably the biggest asset that we have at the moment is, is really getting out and, and talking with individuals and, and actually working on the land. So again, for any questions or, or for any um, e anything that you want to chat through, I'm happy enough to come out and visit you guys and, and, and talk that through. Um, it has been very well received, so I thank you all um, for those that are watching and for those that have been uh, uh, have friended us on Facebook. Um, the service itself has been very re uh, well received, and and there is um, certainly a desire within the community uh, to really uh, look at some of these things in more detail, and, and there's certainly a drive to to have that happen. So we will continue to work in that space. Um, there's some very exciting opportunities coming up, a, a, as Tim mentioned. Um, there will be, there is work going on in the peanut space, and there is work going on in the Poto Peninsula at the moment on winter cropping options, um, which we see as an option as well. So, again, um, some very, some very exciting times for us in the Kuiper. Uh, but as Tim said, if you are, if you are after more information uh, or you want to chat, um, by all means. Contact us at the at the Kai Hub or Tim, and and we can arrange that we can arrange to have a chat about those things. Yeah. Hey, can I? We, there was another question came through, Matt, on um on soybeans, um, and I'd like to I'd like to talk about soybeans. That's an interesting one. Um, when we when you look at what they go, so soybeans sort of just missed the cut, as the, as they would say. Um, it came through from they grow it a lot of it in, um, in in North Carolina, so it came through from the as, as a rotation crop. It's a nitrogen fixing uh, bean. Um, New Zealand uh, imports huge amount huge amounts of it, um, uh, both in in the in the meal for the cake form for, to feed the animals uh, and in the in the form of um, uh, and in the form of oil. Um, so it would it would suit the region in a lot of ways. The challenge with soybean is, is that it's a it's a Big, big global crop, and 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 that's a big boys game, and they play that in the big boys way, and and that's like Argentina and and parts of the U.S. South and, and places like that. The region could reduce it, but you get the, in some of the products we looked at, you get this chicken and the egg problem, and and the chicken and the egg problem is no one's going to plant soybeans other than a, a, a tiny amount to sort of go into Japanese restaurants where they give you the little bowl of it. No one's going to give you, no one's going to plant soybeans until there's a soybean crusher. And, and um, you know who's going to build who's going to build a hundred and fifty million dollar soybean crusher in a region where it doesn't grow any soybeans? And so there's a the chicken and the egg problem there of, of who, who's going to go first. Um, and so we looked at it, we considered it. It, it almost made the the, the 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 six list. Call it number eight uh, on 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 the list. Um, so there's definitely opportunities. There were just a few hurdles in the way to getting to scale in it. Um, but certainly, you know, it, it, it's an enabler to whole systems. You can feed it to, um, you can feed it to, to animals. Uh, you can feed it to pigs. You can feed it to chickens. You can feed it to, you can feed it to a whole whole range of animals. So, a, a great opportunity for soybeans. Um, uh, there's another one that's come through. Um, another couple have come through. Let me just have a look at this. Is this research relevant to, for the rest of Northland or specific just for the Kuiper? Look, it's it's. It, 
the bits that make this valuable are the topo to topo um, climate study which looks at the soils and the, and the and the climatic conditions in the regions and the list of crops it's the it's the meshing of the two of those so if you wanted to look at the list of crops on their own sure a lot of these things if it'll grow in uh, if it'll grow in Kuiper, it'll grow elsewhere in in new zealand certainly uh, we we're identifying the ones that were suited to Kuiper. they would grow in other parts of northland sure but you're going to be looking at trying to do it without um without the advantage of, of of the whole range of information that's there so yeah definitely um there's another question here um uh to what extent has the environment been considered in the research undertaken to date Th that was a given that that that's it that, that's at the base level here I, part, part of the whole driver of of the research um is uh this recognition that that you know we, we can't just keep having more and more and more and more and more cows and, and so you know especially on heavy clay soils so part of this is an attempt to move to um diversify uh, the land use and, and to move to crops that are um, uh, you know uh, more environmentally friendly or, or certainly differently environmentally friendly so yeah definitely it was it was it was underlying the all of the thinking in, 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 in throughout the whole project uh definitely um do you have anything to add, add to either of those to those matt and any yeah, thoughts on soybeans Certainly, from an environmental uh, sustainability perspective, that uh, that's that's one of the things that um, that the the Kuiper Kai Hub is is involved with with several organisations and sort of understanding the impacts of 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 why of what we are doing when we do go into these other horticultural products and being able to to demonstrate a change is is quite high on our list of of, of what we are or, or what we're needing to achieve as part of that um wider food production system when you when you look at i mean we look at new Ze different parts of new zealand and how to grow the food industry quite quite regularly and I, some, a question i sometimes use with, with people is sort of what, what do you want to be when you grow up where, where is this thing growing and if, if i look at new zealand I, I look at you know what are countries that have been trying to do these things for a long time and you go to places like france you go to places like italy like spain and what you see there when you look at their agriculture is a much wider diversity of production. So they they don't they don't just a one trick pony. They, you know, New Zealand too much, Kuiper too much is, is a one trick pony. We're doing cattle systems, a few sheep, and Kumra. You, you're kind of you're kind of at nine, ninety percent of regional you know food production right there. That's unhealthy. That's sort of a mono. It's a sort of a monoculture. And so um, you know uh, they. Diversification, I think, would be wonderful for the, for the environment, at, at a, even at a meta level, and, and let alone at, at the level of the, the basic level. Um, we're just about at time, so we, we, unless, there's, unless there's any other any other questions coming through, we'll, we'll probably start start to wrap it up there. Um, I'll let his one more has come through. Jerusalem artichoke, good stuff. Right? Yeah, they they were on the list. They were they were definitely um, we we definitely uh, we definitely looked at them. It is a root crop. Uh, the, the challenge with it is, is the relatively relative low awareness. Um, you know, it, it's it's not from Jerusalem, and it's not an artichoke. It's uh, it's just, you know, there's another people had other names sort of sun choke. Being New Zealand, we should probably rebrand it and put the word kiwi in there somewhere, kiwi choke or something, which doesn't doesn't have the marketing marketing wow. Um, good stuff has potential. Uh, we could we couldn't get to a very large size of the prize on it. Um, please, who, who, whose comment that was, um, uh, have a look at it in the uh, in the document where we profile it. Uh, and if you want to talk about it, give me a call. Um, make it into spirits. Make it into some kind of shoju, uh, spicy spicy wine, you know, wine, and, and sell it in the Asian market. Um, th there's your opportunity. Um, but maybe we'll, we're almost at time. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you, thank you, Kaipra. Um, Thank you, Matt, for your comments. It's been it's been it was a, a lot of work on this project, and um, and we really do want to see things happen. So anything we can do to make change happen, let us know. And um, Jason, do you want to you want to pull that together? Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and thank you, Matt, uh, also for your uh, uh, contribution to the presentation this evening. Uh, and importantly, those who are watching, uh, this is very much work in progress regarding uh, the developments that are yet ahead of us for all of this work. So Tim has alluded to the topo climate study. Uh, this work uh, hasn't yet 
fully landed through to the council yet. Um, we haven't seen it. It's due within the next few weeks. Uh, you might rem some might remember that there was a significant topo climate study done uh, 18 years ago uh, for the area from Ruawai uh, north to the uh, north side of the Hokianga. Uh, what we've done here is built on that with a new topo climate study for Kaipara district that includes all of Mangafai because Mangafai was not in that original piece of work. So this is part of the next steps. Um, the work that is happening regarding crops as uh, on the ground that uh, Matt Punter has, has talked to a part of the next steps. Uh, and there is great, great progress that is being made and significant developments that are ahead for all of us as we are growing the kai in Kaipara. I particularly appreciate the questions that were coming tonight regarding destination, uh, regarding notions of identity and using soil and so on and so on. The important thing here is we've got a really significantly valuable set of new science and resources, the type of which we've never had before. And we need to be using all of that best thinking uh, for our work ahead especially uh, that question regarding destination um, as well. Uh, looking, going back to where I began this presentation, talking about the three parts of the overall Kaipara Kickstart project, the first piece being about the roads and the second about the wharf network and the third about the Kai project. The important piece of work has just been completed, which is the feasibility study for the wharf network for the Kaipara Harbour, which includes a significant piece about destination planning for the future for Kaipara as a complete place. And it's absolutely fascinating. And how that then fits with the Kai Hub and the work of the Kai and Kaipara are pieces that all plug together and it's look it's it's coming through very very exciting for all of us in this extraordinary place um so i'd like to thank tim uh again for his extraordinary presentation his detail he's he's uh sent out uh those uh contact details for you anyone who reads these uh, research reports all of which are available online uh can make contact with tim very generously and Matt Punter is uh, on the ground uh, regarding the uh, in the Kai Hub uh, in Ruawai uh, as well. So, and we have, as I say, more developments coming along the pipeline very soon. So, I think uh, at that point, I think we can uh, can close uh, down this evening's broadcast. I think, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for for uh, having participated and uh, coming on this journey. And I'm really, really looking forward to uh, seeing these new crops in the ground uh, as we uh, go into the spring. Uh, so, uh, Ruby, is that is that it for us here? Yeah. That is it. Thank you very much to everyone. Okay, thank you. Ka kite, ka kite, ango. See you soon, everybody, uh, and good evening. <laughs>